Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be looking into the modifications I want to make to my network and to my environment here in order to convert it from what I have now, which is it is a it does have a security enclave, but I want to expand it. And so, first of all, I guess let's let's talk about that right after this. So, uh, yeah, I currently have a guard and I have a security enclave that's set up, but I want to include more of it. Right now, the there's two legs to, on that stool, and the first leg is to protect data at rest with encryption and protect data in transit with encryption. So those two things are there, but the third thing I need is the next step, which is to protect data that is in use. That's the third leg of the stool. So how do we do that? And that's what this video is about today. So uh, first of all, I think probably it might help to explain what a security enclave is because there seems to be, I mean, I've read a lot of different definitions for it. I've let, read a lot of different things that people are calling it. And so this is my take. So a security enclave is a protected area within a computer system. It can be one or more computer systems. It can be one, or and it can include the network that's used to uh, both. So you have the computer systems that store data, and then you have the network which transports it, but then you also have the application space, which is used to conduct sensitive operations on that data. So the purpose of a security enclave is just to provide an additional layer of security and that isolates the sensitive information and operations from the rest of your systems. So it makes it more difficult for an attacker to access or compromise them, and this isolation can be achieved through various means such as hardware-based separation, encryption, or strict access controls. And so... so the thing that I have right now is called an enclave guard. And an enclave guard is a security measure designed to protect a security enclave from unauthorized access or tampering. So it permits the inflow of data, and you also can push data out of an enclave with that. But there are rules in place to... to uh, do a couple of things. One, there's rules in place as to which files can be sent o back over the network into your uh, public networks. And two, uh, it also can strip out various fields if you wish as well. They can get quite complex. Uh, they have other features too, like, you know, they might do, they, they might check an ingest file for viruses or malicious malware. Uh, before allowing them to be placed into the, the enclave. And so they have kind of their own working areas that get obliterated, at, you know, periodically. They just get erased and everything gets destroyed in that environment and then it gets re rebuilt on some periodic basis, whatever it is that you choose to do so. So the specific implementations of an enclave guard depend on the type of security enclave and the security requirements of the system it's protecting. Some common types of enclave guards include hardware-based protections, so you might encrypt memory, you might have hardware-enforced access controls, uh, you also might have software-based protections such as authentication and authorization method mechanisms, you may have intrusion detection systems, but the primary goal of an enclave guard is to merely ensure that only authorized users or applications are able to access or modify sensitive information within that security enclave. So, in other words, the data stays there. It doesn't move unless it's, unless it's permitted to do so by the rules and policies that you put into play. The movement today, though, is toward a trusted execution environment, and that is also a secure area of the computer system. It's designed to protect sensitive operations and data from outside interference or tampering. A T, T-E-E, -E, is often uh, implemented as a hardware-based security enclave. So, yeah, it is, it is sort of a, the same kind of thing I have, except it also means that there are, it's physically isolated from the rest of the systems, 
and it's protected by hardware-level security measures. So this allows the T to provide a high level of security for sensitive operations such as maybe you have your crypto cryptographic key generators over there, maybe you store your public and private keys there, and then you disseminate the public keys out uh, to your servers when necessary. And you, you can also use it, of course, to secure your communications as well. So in some cases, a T may be referenced as an enclave or a security enclave. That's perfectly okay. Although this is a, sometimes it, it broadly refers, the security enclaves broadly refers to an isolation area within a computer system. It is used to store or protect sensitive information. And in general, a T and a security enclave are similar concepts. Both are designed to provide secure areas within a computer system and then protect their sensitive operations as well as the data so it can't be, so it remains private. That's the goal. Keep that data private. There are several different technologies that can be used to implement T's. And those include hardware-based T's and software-based T's. Hardware-based T's are built into the processor and other hardware components. That provides a dedicated and isolated environment for running sensitive code and storing sensitive data. So some examples of a hardware-based T include Intel's SGX or, or uh, security guard extensions, as well as ARM trust zones. And ARM has their own hardware-based uh, mechanism for doing that. Both are proprietary and closed, but there are SDKs that are published that allow you to gain access and to control it. So there's also software-based T's that are implemented using software technologies such as virtualization, and those run on top of an operating system, and that operating system itself could also be a trusted operating system. Some examples are, are Microsoft's VBS. There's also the Linux kernel integrity subsystem, which can be used uh, to implement software T's. Are there any open source-based T's? Yes, there are. There's a lot of them. So those include things like you can have the framework, you can have implementations, you can have implementations that build up the applications and help you build the, their, they'll say you have frameworks to build the T. You have uh, DevOps that allow you to manage that T. You also have application frameworks that allow you to build applications that have trust that are built to either run inside of the T or allow access outside of the T as well. And then you also have the applications themselves, which either run inside or make requests through the gateway uh, in order to access that data that's, that's there, provided they have authorization to do that. So what are some examples? Well, there's Aslo, that is a Google project. There's Opti, which is a trusted OS that's provided uh, by ARM. There's also Sci-Fi Shield, uh, which is, I believe, a libOS uh, that also is for RISC-V. And then there's Graphene, which is an Intel open source project. So you can use any of those. What do you need to do to, in order to build one of these up? Well, I'm in the process of designing, so this is what I've come up with so far. So the first thing you want to do obviously, is you got to have some requirements that tell you, what am I trying to protect and how am I trying to protect it? Who Who's allowed access and who isn't? So you need some generalized uh, use cases and, and requirements to help you determine the specific features and capabilities of the T that you're going to support. So then you want to, once you have all that, you're armed with that, now you can go and you can choose the T technologies that meet those requirements. Um, there are different T technologies available, including hardware-based and, of course, software-based T's that we just talked about. So designing the hardware and software components for your T is the next step. And that would include being able to protect things that are executing in the CPU, uh, also being able to protect memory that's in use, that's containing your data, and also your applications, uh, because you don't want those either one of those two things to be modified. Uh, all, without authorization, and then you need to store that information, be able to update it and add to it and delete things from it. 
And then you need to have communication interfaces, which allows you to pull that data up and send it out through the network. Also, you need to be able to update the components and maintain the components within the T as well. So all of those things you have to take into account. So to implement a T software, including the operating systems, when you implement the T software, that's the next step. You need to include the operating system, the runtime environment, any applications, any services that run within the T environment. You want to then test and validate the T to ensure that it meets your security and performance requirements. Because remember, anything you add on top of something that's running as a security layer, it doesn't make it faster. It will make it slower. So you'll want to make sure that if you have SLAs, you're not violating those SLAs by implementing these layers. And you want to make sure that you have the best, best performance that meets the SLA service level agreements that you are, in, you are trying to provide if you're a cloud provider or something like that. So the next is then deploy it and then make sure you're doing regular updates. You have monitors in place uh, to make sure that there's no tampering that's going on with it. And then you need to be able to maintain it so that it maintains its security and also make sure that the T remains effective. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, it's not a it's not a, a a fire and forget kind of operation. You you have to continue to monitor and manage it. Cautions. So overall, the process of architecting in T involves a combination of you need to have some security expertise. You need to have some software development skills. You need to have knowledge of hardware and networking technologies. And it is complex and it's very challenging tasks. But one that is essential for protecting sensitive operations as well as sensitive data. Let's talk about hardware T's, for example. So we have SGX, which is Intel's software guard extensions. That is a set of instructions and technologies that's built into Intel processors. It's been around quite a while. Since about 2012, I think, it was when they first uh, surfaced SGX uh, in their hardware lines. Almost all of their chips has, has support some form of SGX or some version of it. Uh, but the problem is, is that the SGX is turned off by default on the CPUs. So you have to go into your BIOS and your manufacturer of the hardware and the BIOS has to include the support to turn to enable SGX so that it can be used. If the BIOS doesn't do that, then obviously you have no way to enable it and you can't use it. SGX uses a combination of hardware and software security measures that create your trusted environment for running code. It also helps to protect against malicious attacks and ensures that sensitive data remains private. SGX is often used in applications where security and privacy are critical. Uh, such as you might have it in cloud uh, computing and you might have, oh, should I say that word? I'll say it backwards, chain block. And also you need to have online financial transactions as well. So SGX is a proprietary technology that's developed by Intel. And if you want more information about it, Intel has a ton of documentation on SGX. That'll help you understand it. I believe they also publish a, a software development kit for it to help you get started in deploying an SGX solution. What about AMD? Don't they support SGX? Uh, no, they don't, actually. AMD doesn't support SGX at all, nor do I have I heard any plans by them to support it. Uh, instead, they have a different approach to building T's. It's not, it does not create an enclave, however. So AMD's support is to uh, use secure memory encryption or SME. They also have transparent secure memory encryption, TSME, and those protect against physical access attacks. So they, so if you have, envision a virtual machine, they, when you're running the application, SME can protect the memory that's being used by that virtual machine. They also use secure encrypted virtualization or SEV, and that would then encrypt the VM as well. So any kind of system level attacks coming up from the hypervisor, for example, would not be able to access that data in any meaningful form without being able to crack the keys to get it. So 
uh, it's a little bit different approach. So SGX operates, if you look at the rings, they operate at ring three and AMD's uh, SEB uh, and, SE and SME all operate at ring zero. The AMD also supports software-based T's such as Microsoft's uh, virtualization-based security or VBS technology. That can be used on AMD processors to, once again, provide a secure environment for running sensitive code. What about ARM's Trust Zone? Tell me more about that. What does that do? So uh, it's built into every ARM processor. It is proprietary. You do have a public-facing SDK, which allows you to utilize it for building a trusted execution environment. So Trusted Zone is a combination of hardware and software security measures to create a trusted environment for running that code, and it helps protect against malicious attacks and ensures that the data and the sensitive data remains private. So it's doing all the same things as SGX. Trust Zone is often used in applications where security and privacy are critical, such as in mobile devices, edge computing, cloud computing, online financial transactions. Uh, and if you want to learn more about it, you can go to the ARM website. They also have a lot of documentation on trust zones as well. And they will also refer you to a number of projects that are based on trust zone. So what about RISC-V? RISC-V has recently relabeled this project, but and they're, they continue to work on it. But RISC-V is an open source instruction set architecture, of course. It's not, it's not an open chip. So it just means that the instruction set is published and people that can take that ISA and then start building their own hardware. It's just a, a standard specification, very similar to what ARM does, except RISC-V is available to anyone that wants it, whereas ARM, you have to pay for it. RISC-V does not have a trusted execution environment technology built into the ISA. Part of the reason behind that was early on, as I recall, sitting in the meetings with the guys that were doing all of the initial planning, uh, they were attempting to publish the ISA, get it done, right? They were trying to get version one out and get it done. But every time they would make a change, they send it out for a comment, it would come back with additional requests. It would be rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. They kept doing this on it. And finally they said, whoa, stop, you know, we got to get this out. And, and so what they decided to do was to create an extension uh, part of the ISA or an extensions to the ISA that vendors could choose to use if they wanted to, but it wasn't mandatory to maintain in compliance with the RISC-V standard ISA. One of those extensions was initially known as the RISC-V security extension. You may hear it called S-Extensions. And those provide a secure execution environment for running sensitive code and storing sensitive data. Today, you'll hear that called RISC-V PMP. And uh, it is a little bit different than it was in the beginning. But, uh, but again, it's an optional part of the RISC-V ISA. Uh, and if you want more information about that, you can look on the uh, RISC-V International website and look up uh, secure execution. So are there any open source projects that help you build TEEs? So yes, the answer is yes. There are, there are frameworks that are based on SGX. There's frameworks that are based on Microsoft's VBS. And there are different frameworks that are available for libOS uh, type constructions as well. So we're going to talk about some of those. Aslio is an open source framework for developing applications that run in a trusted execution environment, such as Intel's SGX. It's developed and maintained by Google, and of course, it's designed to help make it easier for developers to build these environments and, and allow them to get applications up and running in them. Uh, there's also Graphene SGX, and Graphene SGX, of course, is also an open source initiative that's supported by Intel as well as others, and it provides a set of libraries and tools that can be used to build and run SGX-enabled applications. So it has the support for common operations such as secure communication and data encryption built into it. There's also Red Hat's InRx, uh, and InRx is an open source project that aims to provide a secure and privacy-preserving platform for running computational tasks. And it uses technology called uh, Keeps, 
which form their trusted execution environments. Uh, it's basically a sandbox for running the code, and that helps protect against malicious attacks and ensures that the sensitive data remains private. Opt is an is a operating system. It's a lib OS. I think it's a lib OS. It might be a complete OS, trusted OS, that's based on the ARM Trust Zone technology, and it provides a set of libraries and tools that are used to build and run applications in a Trust Zone environment. It also uh, provides support for common operations such as, you know, secure communication, data encryption, provides the environment for run, running sensitive code, and storing that sensitive data as well. There's a number of trusted frameworks. There's A and M and, and yeah, the whole alphabet. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. There's a, there's a few of them in there, and you might want to look them up. And one of the ones that I have listed here is Trusted Firmware-A. That's an open source implementation of a firmware security system for ARM. Uh, it includes support for trust zone technologies that can be used to build a secure and trusted environment. Once again, for running sensitive code and storing sensitive data. There's also ARM Embed. That's an open source platform for building Internet of Thing applications. So that includes support for ARM trust zones for those environments. And again, uh, it's used to protect sensitive data and operations. Sci 5 Shield is for Risk 5, and that's an open source hardware and software platform for building secure and trusted systems using the RISC V processors. It includes support for RISC V S extensions, and it provides a secure execution environment for running the code and protecting the data. There's Open Titan for RISC V. That's also a hardware security module, or HSM, that's based on the RISC V and includes support for RISC V S extensions. Again, provides a secure environment for running cryptographic operations and storing sensitive data. There's also the RISC-V Secure Monitor. The RISC-V Secure Monitor is an open source implementation of a secure execution environment for RISC-V that's also based on the RISC-V S extensions and once again provides a trusted environment for running sensitive and storing sensitive data. So uh, one of the ones that I've been reading about lately is Keystone. That is an open framework for architecting the trusted extension environment itself. And that is for Risk Five, so that is an open source project that helps you build customizable and trusted execution environments. So, their goal is to build a secure, trustworthy, open source, secure hardware enclave, and that can be applied to a wide range of applications as well as devices. So that's kind of an interesting project. And then it got me wondering, okay, so if all of those could be used, what about Mirage OS? Mirage OS is a library operating system, and it's a, it's a unikernel, so that already has a lot of the lightweight protocols necessary to implement a trusted execution environment. It just needs support for either SGX or, or uh, Trust Zone. That would be possible. So I think it would require some additional work and configuration to do it. But I, but I, you know, here's what I would hope would happen. That, hello, hello, Mirage development team. If you would include this in your base uh, capabilities to either support SGX and or Trust Zone or both, that would be wonderful. Because what, the way I would have to implement this now is the unikernel would have to have the SGX support and the SGX drivers carried with every application that we write. So it would be nice if it was native support inside of Mirage OS, and then I would only have to carry just the driver probably in order to integrate that unikernel in with a trusted execution environment. It may cause performance problems on your unikernel because as we all know, security speeds everything up, right? Uh, no, 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 it doesn't. Yeah, so again, it, it, that approach may not be suitable for all applications. That's kind of what I'm looking at, kind of in the early stages of architecting. I haven't even laid down a reference architecture yet. Normally, the way I approach things is I have what I, I want it to do. So I make a list of all the things and capabilities I need from it. 
And then I start looking at what's out there, you know, what's, and that's where I am right now is in the discovery phase of looking for all the pieces that I need. So if you guys want to help out and you, and you have some comments of some things that I should be looking at to include in my discovery list, please uh, put them in the comments below. I would, I would love to hear that and love to know what you would suggest. Uh, the other thing is that once I get that done, I will look for reference architectures using the products that I am kind of looking at, whether that be SGX or Trust Zone or what have you. I would probably have to look at a, a combination of both. I don't currently have any Risk Five in my network except for some really tiny chips that were sent to me last year. So, yeah, I do have those, but I don't know what help those are going to be to me. So uh, they're more of a development environment to kind of play around and experiment with things. If you're interested in this, let me know also in the comments below, and I'll keep posting updates as I proceed through this. It, I mean, I'm not in a big hurry to do this. It's just more of a play. To, it's more of a toy for me. It keeps me sharp, keeps me interested in things that are going on. So that's all I had today. Hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all again real soon. Bye for now.